um, you guys are probably like, whoa, no hair makeup shit. I mean, to be honest, no. To be honest, um, it's one of those days. It's one of those days. And you guys know that I know that you know, I'm extremely honest with you. Um, and I am just like not, I was not feeling makeup today. I was not. And I think that's so important for today's society for girls to not feel this pressure. I remember I was talking to somebody yesterday and I said, oh, well, when I went to high school every day, I put makeup on. And, um, and I remember they said every day, I said, every day I put makeup on. Hey, Jen, how are you? I would love to put you on this. Everybody, our guest today, Miss Jen Ponton, how are you? I am great. How are you? I am good. So I was just talking about how I would love it to be more normalized, especially in today's world for kids or teenagers that we don't, girls don't have to wear makeup every day. And I love that. You know, I remember growing up and I was just sharing this story before you popped up. Um, I remember growing up, I was telling somebody yesterday, I, every day in high school, I was like eyeliner, mascara, the whole thing. And I'm like, now I'm like, unless I'm going to an event or like, it's something really important. Like I am not going to put myself through that. And today Absolutely. I, it was just one of those mornings. I was like, I'm not even going to, I, I apologize, but I kind of don't because there's no apology needed. This is it's your face. It's exactly what it's supposed to be. It's your face. Look at you. <laughs> so, I mean, how were you, what were you like in high school? I want to know what Jen was like in high school because that's so weird made my own clothes so you're from long island yes yes i saw you're from joyzy exactly so we're we're technically family exactly <laughs> pretty, much, pretty much exactly we drink the same water folks absolutely <laughs> yeah. i was um i was kind of punky i was i was sort of punky poser I uh, yeah i was punky poser so like i once Hot Topic like opened near me, I would go to Hot Topic. I would shop at Delia's. Like it was, um, I was very into like skater brands, even though I had never set foot on a skateboard at all. Me either. Me either. The first time <laughs> and it's not going to happen now. Skates, I was like, oh, I can never do Xanadu because oh. that ain't never happening. <laughs> um, yeah, it, it's so funny how like, this are the styles that we thought were cool like I remember growing up the girls had like where I where I lived they had everything was like the little Prada backpacks oh with, lord like yeah with like the Aeropostel like you know little collared shirts layered like, yes yeah there was so much going on back then <laughs> and, and, and like and it wasn't just one tank top it was like four tank tops layered right and they were hoping that it would sort of work as like an airsats bra. <laughs> right, right. And I was like, no, like I was still like, look, I grew up, I've been a plus size kid my whole life. I've been getting my bras in like the regular department, like forever. Like, you know, and yes. like, those girls who would like walk around with the like the four camis and be like, oh, I'm all, I'm all tucked in. I feel <laughs> like I would need like, like 75 of those things and a like a strap of duct tape to be like absolutely hold, to hold this in when um, they would like build in those little tiny shelf bras and I was like who are we kidding yes. we know this is not for us I'll see myself out <laughs> yes the built-in bras and they they got me every time I was like oh so it's just another piece of fabric mm -hmm. uh, okay that that you made somebody so that's that um that's not gonna help me at all but that's right, right. Um, but so you grew up in Jersey. I grew up on Long Island. I, I think there is something so special about the East Coast and growing up in the East Coast or on the East Coast, rather. Absolutely. I mean, what was your childhood like in Jersey? 
Uh, well, I'm f- so like I've lived I've lived all over North Jersey, but I grew up in the sticks. So I grew up in like farm country. I knew kids who went cow tipping. We didn't have a lot of people at all. So I'm very hicky from Jersey. And so like I had access to good bagels and good pizza and like thick accents, but my actual upbringing was very country and and very uh, rednecky. <laughs> but that's kind of nice though to have yes. some quiet, I think, you know, that's what I love about Jersey, Long Island, it, and even Staten Island, is that it is so close to the hub of New York. So you mm-hmm. get those towns like you're talking about, you're talking, and then you get the towns like I grew up in, kind of just suburbs. And then you're literally a train ride away from right. one of the greatest cities in the world with all the musical theater you can possibly handle all the fashion, all the food, all the culture that just, I mean, did you go into New York a lot? Was that something that was big for you? I didn't go in a ton because my parents kind of hated the city. So I would go in with friends and their parents and we would have, you know, field trips and we'd go see a big musical every year with school. And um, I would go to the Thanksgiving parade every year my yes can I tell you Jen growing up that was my favorite thing to watch on tv like it wasn't Thanksgiving until I turned on channel four and Macy and I would put on I would hear Al Roker and my Thanksgiving was started yes for me everybody always asked me like like people will ask me on the red carpet like what was like the greatest moment through the whole hairspray thing for me performing at the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade took the cake. Like, oh, you must have been out of your mind. I was out of my mind excited. <laughs> I was like a kid who literally like was like let free in FAO Schwartz and yes! just, like all the candy in the world and like all the money in the world. Like I literally was just like on top of this float. I felt like, I don't even know. I felt like Santa Claus. It was incredible. <laughs> It honestly was like, I just, it was the most, I remember looking out into the crowd, seeing like so many new faces, but then like a bunch of people that I grew up with surprised me. And oh my God. With signs, and I was just like up there bawling, but I'm like, keep it together, keep it together. You have to sing. It's yeah. The Macy sang to me parade. You got me there. That's beautiful. That is, that, that's glorious. That's the dream, right? I mean, achieved as especially as a New Yorker just mm-hmm. all right one one in the basket for that I'll take the win love but that talking about taking the win you have been winning you have just been working girl you have been going I was just looking at your IMDB and tell me how you got started in this wild and wacky and wonderful business that we all love it's been a minute and I got to tell you, I have been waiting to talk to you for like 15 years. Yeah. <laughs> Tr- really, truly, because I, you were a, you're a couple years younger than me. I had just graduated from college, I think, by the time they were casting the feature for Hairspray. And then once it was released that it was you and all the articles came out like Cold Stone, she's 17. I was like, oh my God, she's 17? That must be so amazing. She's still in high school. That's incredible. And then like, and I've just not creepily kept my eye on you as time has gone by and I was like oh I can't wait until she like comes back to the east coast and we can hang out so this has been a long time in the making I love Uh, that thank you a long time coming well we are here now so we are here now against all odds honestly (laughs) zoom has us it's like zoom has us (laughs) <laughs> so I'm, I'm thrilled to talk to you too, because you've had quite a journey as well. And, you yeah. know, as women in this business, that's a task in itself, you know, but then being different women, um, For sure. you know, I think that poses, you know, I think while it poses a lot of difficulties or hurdles for us to try and get over because they're not there are not as many roles out there as we would like I think personally absolutely or plus size women or whatever um 
I also think, you know, when we get to play these characters that are so special, you know, and so it kind of kind of makes up for it a little bit. But I know, I mean, what's your take on that? Would you love to see, you know, way more plus size characters in mainstream television and streaming? Oh, God, yes. A yeah. thousand percent. A thousand percent. So like at the time that you were making the film and I was just starting to like get my real theater experience, real world theater experience. And so I was doing like really, really late night, like St. Mark's Place Theater, <laughs> you know, Maybe I was Mark's Place. imagine. Um, I love but you're yeah. like the places that just like tick a little part of my heart, you know? Yes, yes, exactly. Um, I was, I was mostly, I was auditioning for musical theater all the time. And I was landing like weird little plays that I loved. I love weird little plays. But I was auditioning for musical theater and flummoxed because as I'm sure your experience was up until that point, you know, when you are a plus size girl who loves theater, congratulations, you're going to be cast as the mother, the grandmother, the uh, arvide in that terrible show that I cannot stand. <laughs> you know, we don't get to be the Adelaides. We don't get to be the Sarahs. Um, and what that sets you up for once you graduate, even if you've done a ton of those roles, and even if you're really excellent, is you show up looking like you or me with a baby face at like 22 years old. And they're like, your resume makes no sense. Cause I'm gonna wanna cast you as a teenager and all of your experience is playing like these crone-like figures. It's very, very true. I look back at the roles that I played in high school and it was like, Mrs. Lovett, Kate and Kate, yeah. Kate Madame Tenardier. You know, it's like all of those like amazing massive roles, but they're women in their 40, like, late 40s, right. early 50s. And it's like, you're just like, yeah. Casting mm -hmm. directors when you're in your like early 20s, late teens are going to be like, what, where, where do we place you? And I love that your high school did Sweeney Todd. <laughs> oh, my high school was, was wild. They did a uh, shout out to South High in Great Neck because I will tell you, it was Dr. Pamela Levy. She was the um, choral director over there at the time. And she's my personal mentor. And every year they would do an opera, like a full opera. When I got there, um, we did oh, one year, we did Carmen and I played Carmen. That that was insane. I had never sang a lick of opera in my life or French. And she taught me like for six months, I don't read sheet music either. So she, for six months, plunked out every note on the piano, taught me word by word. I mean, this woman is incredible. So when it came to like, I think it was junior or senior year, she was like, we're not going to do an opera this year. We're going to do Sweeney Todd because it's as big as an opera. Yes. And then when we took on Sweeney Todd, we realized, oh, it really, it really is an opera. It sure is. Oh my God. But so, I mean, I had come from a school having like those incredible theater, you know, experiences and playing these roles like, I just, it was so much fun. It was so, they were, they were honestly the roles, the times of my life. I had such I a bet. Fun. Yes, that, those are definitely like the, as you age up, those are the dreams for sure. Yeah, I'm like, <laughs> and now I'm like, I'm sitting here, you know, it was funny. Somebody said to me, they were like, well, if they ever did a remake of a movie and then they said, if, who would you want to play? Like, you know, I said, well, you know, they already did the remake of Sweeney Todd. Yes. And I was like 25 when they did it. So they would have, you know, it would have never, again, going back to the casting thing, you know, would have never happened in a million years. Right. Right. So, we can well, dream. I'm going to do. <laughs> yeah, we can dream. We can dream. But that's what it's all about, isn't it? I mean, yes. how, did your, how did your dream get started? How did you say mm -hmm. acting and performing this is somewhat of, this is something I'm gonna do? I, I feel like you can probably relate to this. I've known since day one on this planet. Yeah. I was like, oh, there has to be a place for me. I'm kind of hammy and loud and I wanna make you all laugh and I probably wanna sing too. And I think I could probably soft shoe this. Oh. I guess I could be a cruise director or an actor. 
<laughs> or like an aerobics instructor. And honestly, yeah. those were like my three dream jobs. I and love that. <laughs> Aboard. Welcome, ladies. I can just yes. Know. I would be such a prime cruise director, but I mean, now in now post COVID, goodbye. Like. I mean, can I tell you, I performed after Hairspray on a couple of gay cruises and they were really? like a blast. Yes. I were mean, you like the headliner? Like it was just Nikki's yes, Cabaret? Even, yes. Yeah, I had a one my one woman show and I was doing it at the time. It was so much fun. And I will tell you, back then when I was straight, I used to tell, I'd be mm. like, oh my gosh, you know what? I'd be like, even if I was gay, I'd be like, even if I, I would never go on a straight cruise again. Gay cruises are so much fun. Now, of course, you know, obviously I've come out and I'm like, yeah, why would you ever want to go on a straight cruise ever again? Why? Um, I mean, they're so much fun, but it kind of just feels like you went to the mall and then all of a sudden you're on a <laughs> with those people. Oh my God, that's perfect. <laughs> <laughs> the mall just took off to sea and now you're stuck with them. <laughs> kind of just feels like Roosevelt Field just whoop took off down the Atlantic and then now here you are for a week and a half on a ship with all these people and like you're just like oh god at least I hope I went at this like the four slot machines when they're like oh we have the big casino and you get there it's like four slot machines you're like yeah right of course but there are so many cigars there there aren't even that many people there's so many cigars (laughs) people just go to there to smoke I don't know if I'm going to miss cruise ships. <laughs> it's it's the one time I think it's like, I think it's probably the one time a year when men are like, yeah, we're going to have our cigars this year. And then they're just down there the whole time. Both the way. <laughs> whole time. Just at sea, like ruining their lungs. Exactly. Um, <laughs> so yeah. Gay cruises are where it's at. If you ever get a chance, go, go on a gay cruise. Heck yeah. By the way, and coming out, uh, more, more things in common, like, um, it's a, it's a freaking journey, isn't it? Yeah, it was, it was, um, it was a wild, wild journey for me because I think for so long after Hairspray, there was that, um, like, I'm, I'm sure as you know, when you play a character, you can get so wrapped up in being that character, not just for the purposes of the project, but for other people, because other people love them so much. And um, I guess for a long time, I was kind of living as Tracy because she made so many people so incredibly happy. And I really wasn't taking time to like really, really get to the root of who Nikki was. And um, I think it was really when I was in my late twenties and yeah, that's when it kind of started to unravel. And by 30, I was like, Oh, we are off to the races and gay. Yes. Um, And, and then, you know, I came out to my team of course, and they've been super supportive, but it just, it got, uh, you know, to a point where like I was at drag con with a partner an ex partner Mm -hmm. and like um, this, drag queen I had them I'm I'm on my podcast in like last year and she kept saying um well you were with your girlfriend and I was like and I hadn't been outed yet and I was just like ah and so I was trying to divert away and I just I didn't like that uneasiness in my cast. I didn't like that I had to hide anything on my show and I was like no 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 it's time. So yeah, I ripped the old bandaid off and came out. And so June 20th, um, yeah, this episode, I think will probably be up by then or right around it. Um, but yeah, will be one year that I've officially been out to the media. So there we go. I'm one year after you. <laughs> Excuse me, not one year. I'm one week after you. I came out on my birthday. Congratulations! Happy Pride! Happy Pride to you too, my friend. That's happy so one awesome. year of out and queer. Or how one year, you, you know, it's like time. I guess they say time flies when you're having fun. <laughs> In <laughs> so, indeed, guess, you know, I don't know about you, but you know, yep. Mm-hmm. You know, I think it's just 
because it's fun and we're not saying we're whores people we're saying that we are having fun by genuinely living our our authentic self oh my god living it's like ridiculous. there's there's a whole other lightness about me like I just and I even notice it like I walk around a little bit lighter I I don't you know take so much whew, baggage with me every single yeah. day do you find that Absolutely. And I, I have to ask you if you've had this experience. I l have learned, especially in the last like four months or so, I've learned that coming out for me was the keystone to so much more authenticity across the board in terms of like owning my opinions on things and being less um, placatingly malleable, which is a very feminized trait and something yep. that we learn socially and we learn from our mothers and is prized in women and femmes but um i'm owning my opinions more i'm owning my truths more to the point where i even uh, i even finally disclosed uh an attack that i had gone through uh 10 years ago and that was something that I felt that I was always going to just carry with me, that it was like my burden, my darkness, my, my shame. And something about coming out and being living in that and being authentic and finding love um, in a very deeply authentic way allowed me to release that. So like just mind blowing levels of things unlocking that have created even more lightness that are not just like, how am I showing up in the world and how I identify and who I love and, and what I experience and what other people, how other people code me, but also like, oh shit, like I am a, I'm really accepting myself on a level that I never have. I think you hit something right there that I've always noticed in myself is I was born a people pleaser. Yes. I would do anything. I would do anything in the world to make anybody smile because I just, I, I'm half Catholic, half Jewish. So I have half. You're a cashew. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I'm a cashew. I have half Catholic guilt and half <laughs> Jewish guilt. And it's like, it's like, I always feel bad if I'm not like making somebody happy or something. So I'm always like the biggest people pleaser in the world. Mm -hmm. And once coming out and cementing myself as this is who I am, not Tracy, not a character. This is who I am and putting parameters, border, boundaries, whatever you want to say, creating certain things that were for me that I had never done before, you know? Yeah. And I think that was for me, like, very, very awakening, just saying, like, this is how I'm going to live my life. And this is my life to live. And like, taking ownership of my life rather than letting like, oh, well, you know, we'll just go. And now I was like, you know, and I, I will, I, it's crazy that I say this, but I do credit my, my past relationship. She lit a match under me that just ignited me in, in my business. And I thank her to this day. I tell her, I'm like, nobody lit a match under my ass. And nice you know, like you did, I said. And so, you know, it, it was very much, you know, a big awakening and 30, I think 30 help being there. Yes. You know? A thousand 30 is such a catalyst. Yes. Such <laughs> There's a, just such, such an, an energy shift. to just jump. Ooh. Just like, just do it. And absolutely. I think I, yeah, I was, um, I was, I think I was, was I 32 when I came out? But yeah, I don't remember anymore. But after 30, just after 30 people always, I always get these cameo requests and people are like, oh, I'm turning 30. I'm so, I'm like, oh my gosh, no, it is way more fun than 20s. I'm having more fun in my 30s than I, oh I did in my 20s. It seems like a totally different life, but how do you feel about the whole 20 to 30? Oh God, I would not go back to my twenties for, um, for anything in the world. Right. At all. At all. Um, I mean, I only came out last year and I'm about to turn 37. So I came out at 36, nice little late bloomer, baby queer, but, um, um me too, don't worry. <laughs> 
<laughs> yes. Um, but uh, when I was 30, when I was 30, I gave up a bunch of really like energy vampire frenemies and they had been long installed because like you, Jewish, very people pleasing. And I was finally like, no, I'm done with this. Something just like changed in my DNA. And I shucked off a lot of these um, very formative friendships, but that were horrible for me. If I had seen someone else going, someone that I love going through it, I would have been like, girl, get out. (laughs) What are you doing? I I had an amazing friend in the business say to me when I told him, um, I was talking to him and he's been an actor forever. And I said to him, I said, I don't know what it was about turning 30, dude. He goes, you reached your bullshit quota. Yes. Bullshit goes, quota. I love you reached that. reached your bullshit yeah. quota. So that's, you know, in, in terms kind of that, of, you know, you find out the people who are there for the right reasons. You find out the people who are there for how can this benefit me? And then you start to separate them. And then those people fall into the bullshit quota. And then we yes. reach our cap and we're like, mm, time to take them out. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, absolutely. Not literally, we're not murderers. We're not t- yeah, I mean, I'm but you know, we are from now. Jersey and Long Island, respectively. So right. if, exactly. if I'm something from like Island, that happens. Not Staten Island, that's not <laughs> I love Staten Island. Please don't come for me, Staten Island. Someone has to claim them. We have to, we have to just embrace them. They do. Like the Statue of Liberty herself. Right? She just like, I am here forever. I'm going to protect you, Staten Island. It's okay. Yes. I'm going to protect you for the rest of the world. I got you. (laughs) Oh my gosh. I've, I've managed to completely just have all of New York hate me now. This is fantastic. No. <laughs> um, uh, isn't that what every host wants? <laughs> we must defend the defenseless. I it's mean, only fair. I've only been there like once or twice, but I will say, I will say this. When they do a reality show on, on VH1, like the mafia ones, I mm-hmm. am tuned in like you wouldn't believe. Oh my I've god! I've seen every single episode of Mob Wives. I mean, I is that who Big Ange is? Is that her show? Yeah, she was on that show. Bless her soul. She's been passed a few years, but um, oh. she was like the greatest character. Like a uh, gorgeous heart. You know, that's and that's what I'm saying. There are people like her in New York, just like these larger than life beautiful, wonderful characters who just, and I think that's just something special that the East Coast, you know, you're, you're born with it. Inherently, all the way down to Florida. The second you find out someone's from Florida, you're like, oh, okay. (laughs) This whole relationship is going to be a ride. Got it. (laughs) I'm dying right now. (laughs) Oh my God. It's so true. Oh my gosh. They can't even help it. <laughs> it's like, you know, the whole, um, whenever, uh, bless his soul, my grandfather, my grandfather was a, an inherent New Yorker and a New York cop and was in the Navy. And anytime the poor man saw somebody with like a, a Florida driver's plate, you know, a license plate, mm-hmm. he'd be like, oh, well, George is out for a Sunday drive. He's like, here we go. I keep like, everybody get ready. Start telling a story like, <laughs> like me. And the thing was, was that we had so much family down. His mother moved to Florida when she got older. So they would drive mm-hmm. down there like twice a year to go visit her. My poor oh, grandfather, those rides, he was like, ay, ay, ay. He could oh, no. It. My, and my grandmother, bless her, had the patience of a saint. She'd be like, and she was from Boston. She'd say, it's okay. I'll do all the driving. I'll pack the car. You know? <laughs> so but it's yeah but it's true that whole florida yeah you're like oh for sure yes 
and, and like you're kind of like us so we we have to embrace you but also you like deal with alligators and you never wear real shoes <laughs> real yes where are the real shoes i mean i remember speaking of real shoes you're bringing me back i remember <laughs> my aunt my aunt pam and aunt fran had clear shoes that i thought were the coolest things i had ever seen i <laughs> I thought, wow. I mean, there has to be pictures of me somewhere. And if they yes. are, dear God, mom, mom, I'm telling, I'm warning you. Uh, there's she, she has one photo already, like for a childhood photo that I, my brother now has it in his possession. And I told him if it ever gets out. Yes, I, I love those. Her, to God, Joey. <laughs> I said, no, you have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> And he recently texted it to me the other day. He was like, remember, dot, dot, dot. And I was like, not funny, not funny at all. <laughs> um, but we would go down there and yeah, the clear shoes. I remember that and just, it's Florida. My best friend's from Florida. She lives down there, um, but she's originally from Seattle. So she's always like, you know, I don't, I, I don't know about this place. She's an sure, actor, stranger too. in a strange land. <laughs> well, too, and, and you know, the acting, you know, it's kind of, it's very, very different in Florida. It's very really? game. Yeah. It's a, it's a very different game and it's a very, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's an interesting slope and it's, it's kind of, it's not LA. It's not New York. It's not Georgia. It's not even like Toronto. It's kind of just like in the middle doing something off to the you know, in the Florida way, I guess. Well, that's, I guess, who was pumping out like NSYNC and Backstreet Boys and like the Mickey Mouse Club, I think. So yes. there's, yeah, there's, there's It's some... so true. They're all from there. <laughs> They're all from there. I'm going to write a book. <laughs> I'm going to interview mean, everyone and write a book. Somebody asked me, okay, so now I have to ask you this question because a friend of mine asked me it the, the, the other day. She was like, were you more of an in sync or a backstreet girl? And I was like, okay, I'll put it to you this way. I, my first, one of my first concerts was the Backstreet Boys. Love, love them, love them. solid. But I think Justin Timberlake is one of the most talented singer songwriters in the business producers i love him i think he's a genius and future sex love sounds is forever my favorite soundtrack like i mean album and we played that album to death on this set of hairspray we all had it and we would all play it in our trailers at the same time and we would drive the 80s insane because they would be like we just came from Elijah's trailer. He's playing the same song. Like, can't you at least just sit in each other's trailers and listen to it together? Like, we all we hear is Justin Timberlake. We tortured them. It was fantastic. I mean, I'm so where do you stand on the boy band? Um, well, you took the words right out of my mouth. First of all, my first concert was in sync. Oh my gosh. Okay, so other way around. Yes, I was never that into the Backstreet Boys. I just, I didn't like their hits as much. Like I really loved Backstreet's Back and it pretty much stopped there. Whereas I felt like with NSYNC, all of them were bangers. Yes. So I, yeah. I loved NSYNC a lot and, uh, and I saw them and then, and then I could not agree more. I think about Justin's album all the time and I listened to it for like full summers because it's, it, oh, it, it actually episode. really matures. It's, th yes, this album is one of the best album experiences that you can have. And I kind of miss that ever since we got into shuffles and playlists and stuff. Yeah, I think, I think he, I think that's probably the last album that I've like bought and listened to mm. front to back, you know. Yes. Wild. First one that I ever had, well, not album, but cassette was Ace of Bass. Followed by, followed by Melissa Etheridge. And, yeah. And I didn't know I was gay. What? No, those, those late, those, those signs that we catch just now. I, I played down. nine years of competitive softball. Yes. No. Nine no. years. That didn't no, rub off on you. 
<laughs> that just get coming out of 32. Uh, it just, you know, I think for me, it was that, you know, I just, when you start working so young or when you go to college mm-hmm. or when you, I think when you're focused on something, on a goal that is massive and it's mm-hmm. so big and you have to put all of you into it, I think sometimes, you know, it's, it's kind of okay and normal. I feel like I was like always the, the girl showing up to the party without the date. Like I, I just was like, I was doing a show. So I was like, I didn't have time to find one. I wasn't really interested in finding, you know what I mean? Like, so I, I want to tell all the kids out there who aren't dating, like that's fine too. Like, take your time, live your life, get to know yourself, do your plays, play your sports, do whatever it is, take your time and then come into your own because your own can be at 32, at 37, it can be at 57, it could be at, it doesn't matter. This is your life. You just got to own it, you know? Absolutely. I was, I was in that same cycle of like, oh, I'm in a show. Don't need a boyfriend. Uh, when I got, uh, when I basically was like harangued into dating my first boyfriend who was the worst human, just simply Aww. the worst human. And then I kind of like serial dated guys after that. And I was like, uh, well, no time to sit and think about it. So here I am at 36, like, uh oh. <laughs> Well, you know, I, I dated, I dated guys too. I dated guys too. There were a couple, there were a couple of fellows in there. And, um, you know, my first was on the set of Hairspray. My first boyfriend, love him dearly. He's still one of my best friends. Um, he was one of the backup dancers and, uh, one of the detention kids, like mm-hmm. the sweetest human ever. And, um, and yeah, I dated guys for a while. And he was he was actually one of the first people I came out to. I said, I need to tell you something. And he was like, what? And I was like, well, here you go. Um, and it, he was just so supportive. I mean, so it was, yeah, I found myself like in the relationships with men. I think with him, I was most present because we were filming a movie and it was, everything was mad. Sure. We felt like we were in Disney world every day. Um, but I think in the other relationships, as I got older, like I was in them, but I wasn't really in them. Like I was there. It's like your mm. body's there, but I was mentally checked out. Sure. Yeah. Cause I was like, what I feeling? really don't want to be here. Yeah. I remember when I got engaged, I remember that feeling of, oh shit, I just said yes for forever. Oh no. (laughs) Oh, what is, yeah. You know, I was like, oh, that's what, this is for, oh, forever. I got shit to do. I was like, that's what Uncle Jesse was singing about forever. I was like, ah, no, I don't want to do this. And I was on a cruise ship. And I was like, oh, no. yeah, see, see, yep, I sure do. And it was a straight <laughs> cruise. It was a straight cruise. So you see what I'm saying? See Those what malls, they'll get you cruises? every time. Always get you to buy shit you didn't want to buy in the first place. <laughs> exactly. I walked off of that cruise, that straight cruise with a bracelet I didn't want. I, 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 I bought it for like $75. It was some kind of gold. I don't know what plated it was. Who knows? And I walked off it with that. And, and a fiance I didn't want. So, oh no. <laughs> but I made it off. That was all that matters. And here we are. And, you know, I mean, it, and I'm but by no means am I making light of the situation, but because I haven't spoken a ton about that situation, that, that for me, sure. that engagement it, it was very much a. <sighs> that I plan to, you know, talk about whatever when I'm ready, but something about exactly. you just made me like super ready to be like, and it happened on a cruise ship, no less. Amazing. Oh, so, thank you Amazing. For, for just uh, supporting me while I just told that little, that fun little ditty. Uh, I appreciate you. Yeah. You know, life is all about wild experiences. And I think, especially in, in this business, it's like, I always say, (laughs) I have this theory. I'm like, okay, so 
it's kind of like, you know how for one year for us, it's seven years for dogs. Yes. Okay. In this business that we're in, one year for a regular person not in the business, Mm -hmm. it's like seven years for us. Absolutely. So, in the most you know, unfair of ways. Yeah. It's I'm like, so I'm really like getting to golden girl status. Like I'm like, <laughs> yeah, I'm like, I'm definitely, I'm like my mm, mid fifties, truly. <laughs> like a thousand percent. <laughs> so how has, uh, how ha- given that, like given enjoying more space for you to be really real and authentic with who you are, literally just physical space, not having, not having to hustle, not having to show up on set or go to events or play the whole game. How has that really felt for you? Hopefully within the safety that you've been in. It's been, you know, I had my first live performance, um, like since COVID, since coming out, it was just this past Friday in downtown LA. And it was super, super exciting. I was there with my partner in crime, my amazing friend, Ryan Casada, who is a brilliant uh, musician. And we performed and it was such a fun lineup. Kevin McHale was there and Austin McKenzie yes. and it was just such a fun night and I remember getting ready for the show and I remember I was ordering clothes and normally back in my hairspray days it was heels I was always in heels 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 mm. you gotta be in heels you gotta be in heels and you gotta have this ring matching to this earring to this mm-hmm. and it, and we want you in color and and which it, it was all fine but, and I looked and I'm very thankful for the people that I had guide me, you know, in those times, because they mm-hmm. picked some fantastic clothes. However, for this event, I found myself picking clothes that I was comfortable in. And I wanted to wear because I, they made me feel sexy. I did not wear a heel. I did not wear a ton of jewelry. I did not wear a ton of makeup. I wore lashes. I did a lip. Like I did it the way I wanted to do it. And I, like my mom saw me over FaceTime and she was like, you did your own makeup. Like, and when my mom praises me on makeup, it kind of makes me feel a little special. And I was like, yeah, mom. And like, I, it was for the first time since coming out that, I really, really, really felt like myself as a performer, like I was my feminine self, but I, I was just myself. Like, yes. it, it wasn't like femme, mask, stem, you know, and no, there wasn't any of that. It was just like, I was me and I felt yeah. so me. And there is no greater feeling than just being like, I just feel like so me right now. Yes not feeling like you have to abide by anyone's rules and it doesn't discount let lashes or sequins or whatever. Exactly. It's just exactly where you fall at the juncture. Exactly. And I think, I think mm-hmm. that's what's so special about the LGBTQ plus community is because it's like, you can really just be yourself. And yeah. I, I just, I'm so excited that we now get to do this show again uh, June twenty second. Lovely. We'll be performing at El El Cid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Here and so we'll see. We'll see what look I choose. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> so I have to ask you <laughs> if this was your first time really performing, totally inhabiting yourself. Did mm-hmm. you feel like your performance was also? freer and you were like whoa my throat is not so tight or like whatever it was totally different it was totally yes. different it was because it was with a live band um and I was not singing hairspray I sang criminal by Fiona Apple and bitch Woo! by Meredith Brooks <laughs> yes! and I'm telling you when I looked out there to the audience and we we did a chorus of just I'm a bitch I'm a oh. and everybody was just like clapping and singing along and I just like 
I remember that moment, like that moment, I can still see it right now. And it's like, uh, it was just, that's when I said to myself, now I'm performing as me and people are getting me. I'm like, Mm. now they're getting it. Like they're, they're going along with my, my artistic transformation. I'm not Tracy Turnblad anymore and they're okay Mm. with it. And that's what I felt when they started singing back with me. They were like, oh, she's not singing Good Morning Baltimore. She's singing about being a bitch and a this, but she's living. So we're going to live with her, you know? And I think- Absolutely. And besides, I think- I think you must know this in every bit of your being, but what people love about Tracy is just how she's like, yeah, I'm who I am. I'm going to do it. I'm going to make you freaking smile. And so like you doing that in any iteration, whether you've got a beehive wig on and are doing the mashed potato or not, that's going to be what resonates because that's just who you are. And that's what you're taking into the future. And like, you're also working on your own scripts too at this point, aren't you? Yeah, I am. I started writing and, you know, when the whole quarantine happened, I was like, I need to give myself something to do. Mm -hmm. Um, And I started writing my book and then I started writing a screenplay uh, for my best friend and I. And yeah, that's kind of led to a few other little projects. And I find myself now just, I eventually want to do a book of poetry and stuff like that. So. I love that. That's yeah. so freeing. It, you know, I poetry is how I really started writing. A lot of people don't know this, but I started writing. I wrote my first poem when I was 12, when 9-11 happened. Um, I was in gym class and I think I was in a cast because, well, I spent... I spent a lot of years in cat. I was, I was just a very accident prone child. And Plus nine um, years of softball. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, um, and I was sitting in gym class and I wrote a poem about 9-11 and it ended up getting published and put in a book. And ever since then, it's just kind of been like this, this weird little thing that, yeah, I do. I write poetry and nobody knows about it. <laughs> I love that. That's oh. glorious. Yeah, are there I mean, any, are there any, I mean, I know you're a writer and, and you are, are producing things as well. Are there any other weird little things like that, that I do that like you do? What are, like, what else are you? Would, I haven't really pottery? tried my, <laughs> <laughs> I wish. Um, I'm not, I'm, I'm not much for visual art, but I, I feel like I used to, I used to love be taking on any medium of visual art until they kind of like made you choose in high school. And it was like, you could take pottery, painting, drawing, etc., or you could do band, chorus, drama. Yeah. And I was like, well, see ya. Yeah. Um, but I, um, I'm really into barbershop. So <laughs> I'm a sweet Adeline and I have, it's been a while, but I have arranged some of my, uh, I have arranged, I've made some of my own arrangements of songs in a, in a barbershop bent. So like when I'm just really doing my own thing, I'm happy to just dream that up and plunk it out and, and write it down on staff paper, which is, uh, it's been a minute, but i I've been singing barbershop since I was 14 because of all of the things that my high school had, including an active farming program. um, We somehow did. Of course we did. And of course I ended up taking farming classes. (laughs) uh, I total package folks. She she performs. (laughs) She can, she does it all. I can artificially inseminate a cow while Holy holding a melody me. line. The woman is gifted. I I mean, I couldn't artificially inseminate the moon. I mean, not, <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm my leg, like, my hand-eye coordination, not good. I was the catcher on the team. So oh, of I mean, course, you know, <laughs> of course I was. <laughs> of course you were all these early signs and we just didn't 
didn't catch up. I tried to be the catcher. I really wanted to be the catcher. So maybe like my little subconscious was like, hey kid, get, get in there. But, but I was so bad at it. I could never catch the ball. So they put me in, they put me in left field, which is the least useful field. <laughs> Yeah, I've been there a few times whenever like there was like a sub catcher, then occasionally they would put me on third base because I had a decent arm, um, but I was a crap runner. I, you mm. know, I, I'm four foot 10. My legs are like <sighs> me. So, you know, I, me running is like, do, 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 do. <laughs> you know, it's like one stride for the average human is like five for me. Oh. So like the minute I would hit, like I would hit a far ball and it would look like, oh, easy home run. But then everybody would realize that I hit it and they'd be like, oh, it's just going to be a double. And then by the time I would get to second base, my mom would just get a, a pinch runner and, and <laughs> We called it a day and I was like, it's, are we at intermission now? Yeah. <laughs> Can we take five yet? <laughs> exactly, exactly. I would always joke with my team members too. I would be like, guys, we have our costumes on. They're like, there are uniforms. I'm like, I, I torture them because, you know, I was really the only like musical theatery, but also wanted to play ball. So, not a whole lot of overlap there. Not a big overlap. And I'm seeing Melissa Etheridge. I mean, my friends were, my friends really put up with a lot looking back now in the day. They, they That's were, so good. Oh my gosh. So now where do you live now? Are you out here in Los Angeles like me? No, my best friend is, although she's moving to San Francisco soon. Um, oh, but so I, you know, um, the, the TV and film started really booming here pretty much once I transitioned from theater to on-camera work because yeah. I was so flummoxed by theater, but I was getting really warm receptions in my auditions for on-camera. And I'm like, are you kidding? They're more willing to put a fat girl on TV than they are on stage, which of course I could still rant and rail about for days, but um but I, I just, I found a warmer reception there. And I was like, oh, you have to cast people who look like real run of the mill everyday folks. And so um, I was initially thinking back in those early days, like, oh gosh, I'm gonna have to move to LA, but I ultimately didn't need to. And so like, it's sort of gonna be an as needed thing. We'll see, we'll see where the world kind of settles, but I always figured, if I get a show and I have to be out there, I could like sublet and I could just go be out there temporarily for eight yeah. months at a clip and like come home. Oh, there's, trust me, there's a million ways to do it. I've been playing this game <laughs> for 15 years and I'm always like, I don't live here. And then now I just, <laughs> and then now I just moved back in December. Um, but I've, I've lived in New York for like 10 years at a clip, you know, and then been back and forth and, you know, there, there's so much work in New York now too. So and not just, not just in theater, um, mm. in film, in TV, especially in indie film, which is oh. so exciting. And I love that a lot of these streaming platforms are shooting in New York as well. So mm. I'm like more, more please, um, because I would love to. I, Are you looking for an excuse to come back? Come on. <laughs> Yes, and we got our first uh, multicam studio a couple of seasons ago because um, Kevin Can Wait yes. was, was in there. Yes. So that was like the first time that we've had a live studio audience for narrative work. Wow. Ever since the 70s? I don't know, but it definitely in like my career, so... Who knows? I'm not really, I don't really know how anything's going to like come back. Well, you know, I was talking to, I, I'm getting ready to go back myself to filming and I'm, I'm excited. I'm a little nervous, but I'm excited because it's so different, but it's funny because when I started this particular film back in December, um, I was, we were in video village and we were talking and my co-star said something about filming. And I said, well, do you know that when we started, when I started 
filming. Okay, I said it was actually on film. <laughs> oh. Are you kidding? I said it was actually on film. We actually had to check the gate. We actually had to like, you know, I said it now everything is it's, you know, a what is it, HG? Yeah. Incredible. 4K HD. It's uh, 4K, like you can see every blackhead. <laughs> exactly exactly it's like please whatever whatever makeup company is sponsoring is please it's i know that I, just, of, uh... I know that i talked about at the beginning of the podcast how i wanted to be au natural but really please sponsor me yeah it's bananas how much labor has to go into the film itself i think i've only shot on film once and it's because boardwalk empire was uh committed to shooting on film what was that like because that show i mean the style of that show and just it, oh just beautiful gorgeous beautiful very warm <laughs> very warm uh and the i mean of course because i'm in a body that didn't have a whole lot of clothing available for it they had to make some creative uh choices with like the ancient silk and velvet that they pushed me into oh god but it i mean touching these clothes was incredible seeing the set was incredible um just so much care taken and creativity put into that whole experience i mean it was beautiful it was beautiful uh a lot of a lot of fun oh when i did that episode with rebecca luker oh yeah she was wonderful i mean so lovely there are so many just it's nice now that we can you know look back in our old age <laughs> <laughs> ridiculous seven years for every year you seven are not wrong for every year there. <laughs> yeah no what on earth <laughs> But, you know, isn't it nice, though, that we can look back and say we have those projects that when we think of them, our hearts just like get warm. Mm, You know, I love that. And that's like, that's, I think that for me, when I think of love, that's, that's a feeling I very much correlate with it. It's like that warm, intense feeling in your chest that you're just like, you know, so yeah. I think, I think it says a lot that we, we really do what we love because, for sure, you know, and it's, and it's got cool. that theater family energy to it, but then you can watch it and, and watch it happen all over again. Yes. And well, that's, what's so amazing to me, you know, gosh, here now, you know, we, this summer will be 15 years that we initially started making the movie. My 15 year high school graduation folks, oh my God, (laughs) didn't think I'd see it. Like, (laughs) like what, how did that even happen? Um, And yeah, so it's gonna be 15 years. And I just, the fact that each generation is finding it and finding what they love about it and just keeping it alive, just makes my heart alive keeps me it just because I know you know there are certain characters for me like growing up the um you know Mary Poppins the magical characters that make that just take you on a journey and I feel like Tracy and there are so many awesome characters in in that movie and in projects that you've done that if we could just take people away just for a little while, you know, and just mm-hmm. make them feel like they're safe and, you know, be that for them. That's awesome that, that we can do that. You know, that's okay. all I ever wanted. Yes. Uh, I love that feeling. I love that feeling. So um, new for you and what's going on? Where can we keep up with you? Uh, I do have a podcast, which by the way, if you're ever open to guesting, oh, we I would bet. love. Fabulous. So excited. You uh, I have a tell Diana when and I will be there. 
Gorgeous. I'm so excited. Um, my, uh, my best friend, Lillian Bustle, who is a plus size burlesque performer. Um, she and I host a storytelling podcast called all the fucks. Mm. And uh, just as you were want to talk about like, who did we like best in high school? What did we dress like? That's pretty much the pith of our I podcast. Love it. I love it. And I was like, I can't wait to see Nikki. I can't tell me if you have any questions for her. And she was like, will she want to come on the podcast? I was like, I hope so. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. Consider me there. Glorious. I will definitely let Diana know. Yeah, that's what um that's what I'm working on these days. I'm doing I'm doing some like virtual play readings for Rattlestick and the actors studio. Uh, but for the most part, I've been writing a bunch. Yeah. I, I get back to it. I love it. I love it. Um, yeah, writing a ton and finding strength in my unique voice and like putting out seeds for what I hope we can get to make in the future. Because just like unlocking all of your authenticity um, as a queer person, like I think there's so much power in claiming a narrative for for us as women, as people on the LGBTQ plus spectrum, as plus size people, like there's there's so much agency there and the tides are changing. Like we don't have to just point to two characters ever anymore, um, but definitely needs more because I believe plus size women are like 68% of the population. And so we should be reflected in 68% of protagonists. Just saying. <laughs> I am right there with you. They, uh, there was a movie that I did where they said to me, um, my character, she, you know, she was an insecure girl and she picked mm -hmm. apart her body, the parts that she didn't like. And there of was course. a scene where she was in the mirror doing this, whatever, whatever. And uh, they said, we're going to take it out. And I said, why? And they said, well, because we don't want to make you uncomfortable. Like, you know, you have to stand there in your bra and your pajama pants and like, you know, hold your stomach. And I said, I'm not uncomfortable. I said, this is my body. I live in this body every day. Yes. 7365. I said, I think you're afraid. <laughs> like, this is like, I don't know who I thought it was. This is like, I'm talking to like one of the heads of the network. I'm like, but, um, I just want to let you know that most of the country looks like me. Okay. They don't yes! look like, I, you know, Heidi Klum. I was like, so I said, if you want a movie that's relatable, that people can relate to, then you'll let me shoot this scene. And I said, it's not going to be uncomfortable for me. It'll be uncomfortable for you. And yeah, for we shot sure. the scene. And for me, it was about the representation. I wanted whoever was watching it to be like, okay holy shit like we never see like a plus size girl in a bra like whatever like and I was so just glad that we did it because Perfect. you know there needs to be and and again like you said owning your voice and taking taking control of of what you do and what you put out love it so I wish you well. I have no doubt that I will run into you many, many, many a times. Yes, I'm so excited for that. <laughs> you know I'll be back on the East Coast eventually. I mean, you know you will because you don't really live in LA. <laughs> right. I'm, I've just been, you know, pit stopping here for eight months. Um, <laughs> it's just a little, you know, a little bump in the road. But um, of New York will always be in my home and I'm I'm coming back. My brother is getting married, my little brother. Oh, Mazel Tov, that's Thank wonderful. Yes, yeah, so he's getting married. So I gotta come home and, you know, for his engagement party eventually. So sure. I'm coming back to the East Coast and I will let you know, but um, hold it down for me until I get there. Happily. All right, I'll <laughs> see you soon, sister. Thanks, Nikki. Be good. You too. Bye. Bye. Oh my gosh. What a delight. What a delight Jen is. I absolutely adore her and I adore her for being so open and honest and candid about everything that she's gone through in her personal journey. You know, it's like, 
everybody's journeys are so vastly different, but they're so vastly beautiful. Not like the noise that's going outside my window, but what can, what can you do? It's life folks and it's live. So um, anyway, Jen, thank you for sharing your stories and for sharing your heart, for sharing your talent with the world because you are one gifted woman and I adore you. I adore you already. So congratulations again on coming out, my friend, from one one member of the LGBT community to another. Congratulations. And I'm so, so, so incredibly thrilled for you. And I'm sending you so much love. And I'm sending you all so much love during this month of pride. It is pride month, everybody. And I just want to tell you all that I love you all deeply from the bottom of my soul. Thank you so much for embracing Tracy Turnblad 15 years ago when, or, you, you know, in 2007 when the movie came out, but thank you for embracing me and, and loving me for who I am. It means more than, you know, um, and just know that I love you for who you are and you're all absolutely incredible and you make my day every single day. So happy pride. I love y'all. Bye. Bye.